Uh, the first question is going to be obviously about Harley Quinn. Mm, of course. Harley Quinn first appeared in the Batman the Animated Series. Yes. Why did you choose to tell the origin of the character in a comic book and not in the series first? Well, uh, what had happened was the DC Comics had very generously extended an offer to Bruce, Tim, and myself to tell any story we wanted to in comic book form. They were very pleased with the way the animated series had turned out. They loved the look of it. They loved the tone of it. And um, they were looking at ways to kind of cross-pollinate, you know, like, uh, you know, to, to uh, trade off the, the show and, and also incorporate some of that look into the, into the, into the, the books. So they had said to us, if you ever want to do a story, you know, pitch it to us and, you know, we'd love to have you do it. And so we were, we, we went to lunch one day, and I remember this very clearly, and we were thinking about the kind of story that we wanted to tell, and, and we said, what about our, an origin story of Harley? It made a lot of sense for us to, to do that because she, is a, she was a character that really popped in the show. We liked writing episodes that featured her. The audience liked her, um, and they were liking her more, you know, all the time. And she was kind of an unknown quantity. We didn't really know where she came from. We only know that she seemed to traipse around after the Joker and seemed to worship him. And we started talking about where she came from, and we said, what if she, you know, the ideas began flowing, and we came up with the idea that she had been the, do the Joker's doctor in the insane asylum, and now she had become this insane person herself, you know, this kind of needy, yeah. insane warped individual who was just following after him. And there was also the idea that we had been playing with of um, sometimes that uh, a, a person will develop a fixation on a killer in prison. You'll hear about women writing letters to, to killers Manson. and psychotic like Manson and stuff like that and uh, saying, I love you, I understand you. So we figured Harley had some of that in her, that she had gravitated toward this dangerous personality. And the fact that she had been a psychiatrist and somebody who had been snapped by the Joker made it much more interesting and also much more tragic. Um, also, the reason we decided to tell it as a, a, as a comic book story was we felt there was no way we could tell that story on the TV show. For one thing, it was a very Harley-centric story. Batman is in it, but not all that much. And um, I think this would give us the, the ability to tell a longer story a more adult and violent story, and a story that concentrated on a sideline character, uh, whereas if we had tried to do it in the, the TV show initially, we would have met, I know we would have met with resistance from the network. They would have said, it's too dark, it's too violent, it's too sexy, and you know, Batman isn't in it enough. But it, it worked out perfectly by doing it as a, as a graphic novel. Okay. Uh, what do you think of the character's evolution, especially with the New 52 and in particular in, uh, with our emancipation from the Joker? Uh -huh. This I, is a different version, kind of? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it because uh, I, was, I was sort of surprised that she was in the New 52 because I thought, you know, that I didn't know what they were doing with the New 52 and I thought they might have just retconned her out of existence. And, but no, they had these plans to really play her up and, and uh, they changed the character significantly. but. I don't think that's a bad thing. I feel like they brought in other creative people. I think they kept a lot of her essence the same. A costume change is a costume change, and I'm not all that, you know, concerned about it. Some elements of her origin that they redid, I was like, eh, okay, well, it works for you, it's all right. But it's, um, more than that, I was happy, like I said, the essence of the character had been preserved. Yeah. But um, I also feel that, where, where, was I, where was I going with this? Um, I felt like there had to be a disconnect in my head between the way I had been writing her and, and where she was going. I don't want to be a creator who is very possessive about, yeah. the, about the character must be maintained in every direction, you know, okay. every, all the time. And I feel that, uh, um, that if, other, if the character speaks that loudly to other creative people, then they deserve the chance to make their statement with her too. And I didn't really want to write her as an adjunct to the Joker anymore. In some of the later Batman episodes I had written, um, I think there was one called Joker's Favor, where she actually beats him up at the end because he rejects her and gets a new assistant, and then she breaks out of prison and tracks him down. I would have gone more in that direction if we had done that, because I felt her relationship with Poison Ivy was just as valid as her relationship with the Joker, and it was actually more fun to write 
two women as friend, two bad women as friends than it was for Harley to be the simpering tag along to the Joker. And uh, recently I have been writing her as a standalone character. I, uh, I've gone back and written some cartoons with her recently where she is just on her own and more of a sprite, more of a mischief maker, still on the wrong side of the law, but not beholden to the Joker or even Batman in any sort of way. She's just a troublemaker in the DC universe, which is something I've always wanted to do with her, just do solo stories with her on her own. And I was happy to be able to do a few of those. Um, and when I see her in the comics, I just, I just like the fact that she's still out there. She still exists and, and people are having fun with her. And uh, it's kind of overwhelming, you know, that, yeah. that she's become such an icon. Yeah. Uh, as uh, one side dead, how do you feel about seeing Harley Quinn in a movie uh, more than 20 years after you created this character with Bruce Tim? How does uh, it feel? Great. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, hey, there she is. I mean, I know nothing about the movie at all. Yeah. I only know what I've seen in previews and what I've seen in some still shots uh, of, of her, apparently, as Dr. Quinzel, either analyzing the Joker or holding a gun on him or, or, or something. And I know of the, the crazy version of her with the shorts and the baseball bat and everything like that. So I'm as intrigued by anybody else to see what you know has happened you know, with her. And um, I read an article where Bruce said, you know, well, that's interesting. It's a different interpretation, but it seems to be okay. So he seems to be okay with it. So, you know, I won't, I won't have anything to say about it until I see the movie. And I, you know, probably see that when everybody else sees it. No, just so, okay. uh -huh. um, About Dark Knight, a true Batman story. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was coming out next June. Mm -hmm. uh, what led you to write and go public with such a personal, very personal story? Well, you know, it's been 23 years since, uh, since the mugging incident, and I felt that my life had evolved in a lot of ways where I felt that I'd gained some perspective on the incident and on the story and wh where my life was. And the fact that I'm older now and I've made some, de some different choices within my life that I'm very happy with has made me look back on that time and and analyze it, a, a, you know, a, a bit differently. And uh, it's sort of that story of the road not taken, what, what I've done what, differently back at that time. Um, I remember one of the, the key things that got me thinking about it was about four years ago, my wife, uh, Misty Lee, and I were on Kevin Smith's uh, podcast. Yeah. He was doing a podcast with his, with his wife, uh, uh, Jennifer Swabach. And we're good friends and we were sitting around kind of, you know, goofing around and, you know, talking about this and that. And Kevin says, tell me about the mugging. And it's like, the mugging? You want to want to know that old story? And he goes, yeah. And I think I had mentioned it to him when I first met him that, that it had happened or something. But, you know, I, I told him what had happened and he said, if that had happened to me, I never would have left my apartment. And I said, yeah, you would have. You're a filmmaker. You deal with a lot more shit than that. And it's like, no, I don't, you know, I, I think if that had happened at that point in my life, it would have really hurt me. Yeah. And then I began thinking about other people I know who have dealt with tragedy in various ways or have not dealt with tragedy and let them kind of overcome them. And I, um, I, I thought that maybe people are meant to learn from other people's tragedies and triumphs, uh, ways to, they can, they can look toward answers in their own lives. And so my desire to tell the story was sort of like, look, I, I had a really bad time here and I was able to, with nobody else, just sort of work my way through it and examine my life and kind of force myself back into work. And if I can do it, you can do it. And uh, in my case, I, the Batman characters were very... Uh, in the forefront of my mind because I was writing and doing the show at the time. But after the incident, directly after it, I didn't want to do the show anymore. I wanted to uh, get away from it because I didn't believe in crime or superhero stories. They had lost all meaning for me because, you know, there is no justice. Two guys attacked me, viciously beat me, and, and, uh, and went away laughing. And, you know, there's... Where's the justice in that? They, you know, the, the police never caught them, and, and I had to deal with a lot of fear. I had to undergo some expense uh, in, in having my face rebuilt and, and therapy and everything like that. And, but I was also at a point in my life where I was living alone. I was not seeing anybody. I had kind of 
created this little geek universe that was very happy around myself, you know, and in almost kind of in a smug way. I've got a got nice job, I've won a couple of awards, I can buy any toy I want, my life is pretty good. When I, the night of the beating, I came home and I was in an empty apartment and I realized there was no one there to say, oh my God, what happened to you? And it was just a room full of shit. So at that point, I began to think differently. And it was a long evolution from, uh, from that night, you know, to the point where I felt like I could write about it and then, um, and just sort of tell a story about what it's like to sort of, I don't know, put things back together again and go on. And so like today's, yeah. yeah, there is no, there is no outside superhero, but maybe there's one inside you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hush. Yes. Is a very, very important character uh -huh. all along uh, on Detective Comics and finally on Street of Gotham. Right. Uh, why do you seem to like him so much? Well, Hush was a challenge because um, right before I wrote Heart of Hush, uh, somebody called me up and the, or, or emailed me and they said, tell me about this Hush series you're writing. And I go, what? what? What Hush series? And they said, well, Dan DiDio says you're right, you're reinventing Hush. And I got on the phone and I went, Dan? Am I writing a Hush story? He goes, oh yeah, yeah, I was at a convention. We, we want to redo Hush and you're the guy to do it. I, I, I don't know anything about the character. I don't really like the character. He's like the unknown soldier with bandages. Yeah, but think about it. Come up with something. And, I, and, I thought, and I, it's like, here's a challenge. Here's a character I would not have wanted to have write. You know, I feel like, well, he's Jeff Loeb and, and Jim Lee's character. You know, he, he's, he's for them. I mean, it's like, it's like what if they had handed him them Harley Quinn and said, do something different with her. Um, at least Jeff should have first chance to do the character. Or Jim, you know. You should have some response, but it was basically, no, you take it, you do it. And so the fact that I was given this assignment, that forced me to think about the character, and I thought, what's interesting about this Tommy Elliott guy? Well, you know, the, the dynamics of Gotham City, the upper crust of Gotham City, is something that I've always found sort of interesting. In some ways, it's as venal and evil and crime-ridden as the criminal, the underworld, because you're dealing with... Uh, the society of haves versus the have-nots, and you have some very benevolent haves and one percenters in the, the Wayne family who, you know, Thomas Wayne and, and Martha were charitable people, giving people, and, and you know, which makes their, their deaths all the more tragic and their murder all the more tragic. Then you've got something like Tommy Elliott, who's also born into wealth, with a mother who is scheming and a social climber and resentful of her son and always holds up Bruce Wayne as an example to this kid. And once I began thinking of that mother-son dynamic, Hush became a lot more valid to me. And I began to see that he really was a dark mirror image of Bruce Wayne with, you know, he tried to kill his parents, but one survived. And Bruce's father saved his mother's life, and now she became this bete noir in his life, this constant goading presence who he would never be good enough for her, and he would, she would always hold up Bruce Wayne as an example, so he would grow up despising Bruce. And it was fun dealing with other people in Gotham because, uh, you know, I, I played around with the idea that Thomas Wayne in his, in his younger days hung out with colorful people like Giovanni Zatara, and they were kind of, you know, men about town together, you know, I imagine like Thomas was his wingman and Zatara would do bar magic and they, you know, <laughs> flirt with girls and stuff before he met Martha. And it was fun playing around with those ideas and then also, um, you know, uh, uh, Tommy's mom would look at somebody like John Zatara, even though he's a celebrity and, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know world famous magician is you know, some scummy gypsy and his, you know, you know, ratty little daughter. And, you know, these are some of the greatest magic workers in the DC universe. So to color it with that element of, of social, social climbing and, and, and social stigma was interesting for me because, you know, the Zataras are wretched gypsies and, and the Waynes are, are, are people I want to suck up to but I secretly despise. Poor Tommy couldn't have grown up as anything but a really screwed up guy. And a lot of those feelings were transferred onto him. And, uh, and so he became a very likable, not, not likable in the fact that there was anything heroic about him, but suddenly I, I really liked the, the venal, awful, yeah. scheming nature of the Elliott family. 
it, it became the soap opera to me. And uh, I think it kind of took people by surprise. I don't think they were expecting that I was going to go that route yeah. with it. And I still think I was faithful to the idea of Hush as a doctor and the idea that he reworked his face and now looked like Bruce Wayne. And it was at a time when Bruce vanished and they, the heroes forced Hush to kind of impersonate Bruce, I thought was sort of interesting. And I, I really like that solo story where you got to escape and run away and yeah. assume Bruce's identity for a while. Uh, you know, I, I had a lot of fun with him. And uh, in that, in, in, in those stories, I, I just felt I was off in my own little universe and whether those remain canon or not or those stories fall by the way. So I don't really care. I just really enjoy yeah, sure. doing them. Yeah. One last question. Sure. Um, you've created and used a lot of different characters from the Batman universe in your stories. Sure. Um, which one, if there is one, do you identify the most to you? Uh, I, I think I did identify with Harley quite a lot, you know, and I and, I, and I, there was a lot of me in the early versions of Harley because of the idea of um, possibly choosing someone in your life that is no good for you or allowing yourself to become a fool for somebody, a losing your sense of, of yourself in pursuit of somebody else. I think we've all done that to a degree. I wrote about that in the, in the introduction to Mad Love. So um, there is, you know, and, and but Harley also represents uh, uh, fun and innocence in kind of a madcap way. And, uh, and, uh, and so in my lighter moments, I kind of think like that. But initially there was a lot of the idea of Uh, you know, the, 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 the wanting something that maybe you shouldn't be after in the first place. And uh, so there was that. You know, there's some Batman in me also. I mean, a cool Batman. Yeah. You know, everybody wants to be Batman. <laughs> yeah, so, sure. you know, drive around the car, and <laughs> look for trouble and everything, and be millionaire Bruce Wayne. A, a, friend, a friend of mine once told me, you know, like he had to. You know, he, he was in, a, in another city and he was feeling lonely and he, and he couldn't leave the apartment. He felt so out, awkward. And I said, you know, you're Bruce Wayne. You're James Bond in these situations. You know, just pretend, you know, like you walk down and you're millionaire Bruce Wayne or you're James Bond. Don't fear that empty seat in the restaurant. So it's a table for one. Just go in and I'm Bruce Wayne and I'm secretly doing detective work on a criminal I know who's here. Or I'm James Bond and at any moment uh, my contact is going to come in. So, you know, play. You know, yeah. uh, you know uh, fantasize. It's fun. It's fun to be that. If you can pretend that you're brave or, or, or um, fun-loving, uh, and chances are you, you probably are. So, Thank you very If much. that makes any sense at all. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Great pleasure.